What is up, Thrive Austin Church community? It's Pastor Scott here. Thank you so much for tuning in to the online stream today. If it's your first time joining us online, I just want to say welcome to you. We are so glad that you decided to tune in today. Do us a favor and let us know you're here by just commenting in the chat. Maybe just put a little raised hand or maybe just say, hello, I'm here. Tell us where you're from, whatever. But we are so glad that you're tuning in today and we hope that you will find the next few minutes that we have together encouraging you for you in your walk with God. I'm going to open us up in prayer and then we're going to get started with worship. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather, even online. And Father, I pray that every single person who is watching today, wherever they're at, whether they're shopping for groceries or if they're cooking dinner or if they are on a jog, wherever we are, Lord, I just pray that you would come and meet every single person exactly where they are at. And I pray that right now in this moment, you would just come, that you would bring peace to every heart of every single person watching. And Lord, that you would bring your power, your transformation, as we begin worship today. We love you, Lord. Amen. I hope you enjoy the stream. Father in heaven, 
all of our hearts, Jesus. Lord, we are going to declare that you are our way maker, our promise keeper, yes. our miracle worker, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are the touching every heart. I work.
Austin, how y'all doing tonight? Okay, come on. How y'all doing tonight? 
get a little lively here. You guys, if you haven't already sat down, please sit down. I usually forget that one, so I do apologize. Uh, my name is Scott Harmon. I am the youth pastor here at Thrive Austin, if you don't know me. And I'm here to give you some announcements right now, okay? We have a lot of stuff going on in Thrive. And first thing I want to tell you is that we have three signs in the back. And if you're online, I'm going to ask you to do something different. But the three signs in the back have a QR code. If you are here tonight, I ask you to hit that QR code, follow the link, and just let us know you're here. That also gives you information on our bulletin, tells you what's going on. It also allows us to connect with you in case you have any prayer concerns or anything else going on. So I'm going to ask you guys to do that QR code. If you are online and you are streaming us, hi, how are you guys doing? Um, I want you to do something else. How about you send us a message? Okay, send us a message on Facebook. Tell us what's going on. Tell us if you have any prayer requests. And just let us know what's going on, what we're doing well, what we're not doing well. We love your feedback. That is why we are continuing to develop new ways of connecting with our congregation. Okay? And some of those new ways are going to be up here on the announcement slide. I'm going to have put up here right here. Three. Okay, even quicker than I thought. Sorry. Okay. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on. We continue to add more things, so let me go through them real quick. We have our small groups. We have... Women's small group happening at 6 o'clock on Thursdays. They are working on Thess Thessalonians. And we have men's on Saturday morning at 8 a.m. They're studying the book of Acts. <clears throat> I am part of the men's group. We are doing it on Zoom. It is a lot of fun. Acts has a lot of books, so we've been doing it for a while. But we would love for you to all be a part of it. So get a hold of Scott, myself, Cody, any of the guys around here. Most of us are in that. We can get you the information for that. If you are interested in being part of the women's group, they are actually meeting in person, I believe. And you can talk to Sarah, Jesse, um, Raphael. You know, you can talk to any of them. Sorry, that definitely made me sound really, really old, I think, by pulling that joke off. I apologize. Um, but they will give you the information for that small group, okay? Other things that are happening in Life with Thrive, we have our children's ministry, and it's excellent. Jesse is doing a great job with that, meeting them, really having kids connect God in their lives. Um, she has a bunch of things going on right now. She has Zooms at 4 o'clock on Tuesdays, okay? So if you have a child in the children's ministry, there's a Zoom, 4 o'clock on Tuesdays. She also has online content that comes out on Sundays at 11 p.m., or 11 a.m., not p.m., sorry. And that is a great way for you and your family to sit down and study the Bible together and work through the lessons together. As far as youth, youth has had some fun this summer. We now have our youth groups starting next Sunday. Right now, they're going to be starting in Buda. They're going to be starting at uh, my house, my wife's in my house. Um, and we're going to be hosting that. There will be more information coming out on Facebook this week, and we'll push it out on Instagram also. Um, another cool thing that we developed because of these communications, because we know what you guys want from us and we can reach out and talk to you, we have affinity groups going on. We have the movies happening tomorrow at 5 p.m. We have a COVID fitness group Monday at 7 p.m. and a back to school group that's going to be happening on the 24th and the 31st at 7 p.m. Information is on Facebook or you can grab Scott or Sarah or Jesse, myself, anybody that can give you some information on that before you leave tonight. And last thing I have to tell you about, Wednesday morning prayer groups. We're doing this on Zoom at 7 a.m. And this coming up Wednesday will be my wife, Kara, and myself will be on the Zoom chat. And we're just there to pray with you. If you want to be part of prayer with us, if you have prayer requests, hop on, talk to us. The information is on Facebook, okay? So that's all I have for announcements. I'm going to darken your doorstep for one more minute. Uh, we're going to flip over to another slide I have for you. And it's going to tell you why I want you to pull out your phones right now. So everybody, right now, grab your phones, go to Facebook, and check in, okay? A couple of reasons why I want you to check in. First of all, I want you to let everyone know that you're here and thrive with us, okay? It's great for us, great for you. Things are happening here. God is working, and we want you to tell people. But also, if you tag us and you put down Causely, you are going to be helping build schools. For, so for every check-in, every 10 check-ins, we're providing a brick to build a school in a developing or third world nation where they need assistance and they are not nearly as fortunate as we are. So please grab your phone, check in, tell them you're at Thry, tell them how great the day is going, tell them about your connection, or better yet, during the week, if you're just thinking about God, you're praying, you're just talking to him and having a conversation, check in then too, okay? These check-ins do help, but we would love for you guys to do them, okay? Okay, now, I am going to get off the stage now, but I'm going to pass you off to 
our lead pastor, Scott Hatch. Thanks a lot, Scott. So how's everybody feeling tonight? You guys glad to be at church today? I'm glad to be at church today, and I know I always say that, but it's true. I am so pumped up to be with all of you guys, and I noticed it's a little bit warm in the house today, but what I want you to do real quick is I want to turn, I want you to turn to your neighbor, I don't care how far away they are, and I want you to say, neighbor, it's hot, but I came to hear God's word, and I believe he's going to speak tonight. Praise God. Praise God. It's so good to see all of you. Thanks for joining us here at Thrive Austin Church tonight. I'm the lead pastor at Thrive. If you're jo joining in online, I want to say welcome to you. Thanks for tuning in to our stream. There are so many fantastic churches you could have visited or you could have streamed online and you chose to be with us today. And that is just amazing. And I also want to take a second to say thank you. I want to thank all of you guys who are here today. I want to thank those of you at home online who continue to support the mission here at Thrive Austin Church. The truth is, is that we cannot bring transformation to our community. We cannot create a place where people connect with God and thrive in their relationship with Him without your generous support. And we are so thankful for the many ways that you contribute to the cause here at Thrive. And there are different ways you can give. You can give in the little box that says Thrive Austin at the back. Or if you're online or even here in person, you can give online by texting the number that's up on the screen. Simply text the word GIVE to that number that's up there and the amount that you would like to donate. We are so thankful for that. You can also visit our website at www.thriveaustin.church. But once again, we're so thankful for the ways that you guys continue to extend your hand, to open your hand and give. Thank you for your generous support here at Thrive. And today I am so excited and I just want to ask y'all's permission real quick. Do I have y'all's permission to preach today? Can I get y'all's like? Can I get y'all's permission to get a little bit into it? Is that okay? I mean, I might get a little bit animated up on this stage today because I am so pumped up to preach. But before I get into my message, I gotta say this: this message, sadly, I gotta apologize. This message is not for everybody here tonight. It's not. It's not for everybody. And you know how hard it is as a pastor to create a message that really speaks to every single person. It's tough. I mean, we got some different kinds of people in this room tonight. We got, we got Republicans, we got Democrats, we got people that live in Buda, we got people that live in Austin, we might even have people that came from Phoenix, Arizona who are here tonight. I mean, we got people from all over the place, and if you're tuning in online, you're from all over the globe, right? And so it's hard to create a message that speaks for everybody, and so I gotta say I'm sorry, this message isn't for everybody. This message is only for the people today who have a hard time Getting past your past. This message tonight is only for people who have a hard time getting past your past. Or in other words, have a hard time putting your past behind you. Now to get things started today, I just want to take you guys back to 1994. And boy, it was a glorious year. 1994, and I was in the sixth grade, okay? 1994, I'm in the sixth grade. And in a tiny town that I grew up in, Wolford, Texas... Sixth grade was considered intermediate school. And in sixth grade, I had a crush on the, what I believe was the hottest girl in the entire school. I'm talking about, this is sixth grade, and I had a crush on this girl. And Shelly Preston, if you are listening today, you missed out, okay? That's all I gotta say. But I had a crush on Shelly Preston, and she was everything. I mean, I just thought she was one. I thought she hung the moon. It was amazing. And, and I even had a class with her. It was reading class during the sixth period. And so I thought to myself, this is my chance. This is my opportunity. It's going to be in reading class where I'm going to win Shelly's heart over. And I was just so excited to have this class with her together. So reading class just so happened to fall right after the lunch period. And uh, one day I was not really feeling very good. I was kind of, I had a stomach bug. I don't know. I don't know what I, what I had, but my stomach was not feeling very good. And on top of all that, we had red bean chili for lunch that day. Now, I think some of y'all kind of know where this is going. So it's right after lunch and we're in reading class and the teacher says, okay, we're going to take 30 minutes now. Everybody silently needs to read their accelerated reader book. We had accelerated reader back then. We need to read your book and we're going to spend the next 30 minutes in complete silence reading our books. And so there we all are sitting there, sixth grade, everybody's reading their books 
in silence, and suddenly my stomach begins to grumble. And I mean, you could have heard a pin drop in that room. That's how quiet it was. But my stomach, it was, you know, it was rumbling. And the next thing you know, I let loose of the loudest, <laughs> like, most disgusting, like, fart you can ever imagine. I'm sorry, I'm just going to go there. I'm just going to say it. All right? That's what how I parted the girl's hair behind me. I mean, that's how bad it was. It was just, it was bad. And everybody, I'm talking about everybody in the classroom, busted out laughing. I mean, everyone. I mean, even I was laughing. My best friend was laughing. Shelly, of course, she was laughing. Uh, the teacher was even laughing. I mean, it was rough. It was bad, okay? And for like a week, that's all everyone can talk about. And even to this day, I've gone through lots of counseling. And, and I'm much better now. But even to this day, I still remember that day in sixth grade reading class. <laughs> and I shared that story today because that's my sixth grade reading story that stuck with me for a lifetime, really. And I share that story and it's kind of funny and we can all kind of laugh, but the truth is, is there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about that. And that's, that's my funny sixth grade story, but what I would guess is that there might be people here today and there might even be people who are listening to the stream today who that might be my funny story, but you've got a story that's not so funny in your past and it still continues to haunt you even till this day. And I'm not just talking about 30 years ago past. I'm talking about perhaps even last night past. Yeah. I'm talking about last week past. I'm talking about last month past. And it's either something that you did or perhaps something that was done to you. And my guess is that every single person listening to this message today, there is either a season of your life or an event that happened to you or something that you did that you wish you could erase and you wish never happened. Most of us walk around with these kinds of things in our life. But what I want to do today is I want to point us to a very powerful verse. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is writing a letter. And he's writing this letter to the church at Corinth. Now, the church at Corinth was a messy church. It was a messed up church. In fact, there were people who were sleeping with prostitutes in this church. That's how messed up it was. One guy was sleeping with his mother-in-law. There was They were even eating food that was being sacrificed to idols. I mean, shoot, they were even getting drunk during communion, okay? I mean, if people are getting drunk during communion, you got problems, all right? It's a messy, messy church. And so Paul writes to this messed up church in Corinth. And in chapter 5, here's what he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. Now, I, I, I'm a little bit of a student of Greek, and I looked up this, this particular verse in the original language. And did you know when you study this in the original language, the word that is translated here as anyone, do you know what it means in the original Greek? It means anyone. Anyone. Anyone who places their faith in Jesus will be made new. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. That means that anybody who takes that step and places their faith in Jesus, the moment you place your faith in God, you become a new creation. You are born again. The old self goes away and you are a new creation. You see, the good news of the gospel is not that I was a bad guy who needed to be made good. The good news of the gospel is that I was a dead man who needed to be raised to life. And it's the same for every single person that follows Jesus. That is exactly what Jesus does when he comes into our lives. He makes us a new creation. And if you don't hear anything else that I have to say today, here's what I want you to grab a hold of. That is that if you don't let your past die, your past will never let you live. Another way to say it, if you don't let your past die, you will never thrive in your relationship with God. And my hope is that there would be somebody who is here tonight or that there's somebody who's watching this stream today who would apply this simple truth to your life and that you would find freedom and be able to step out of your history and into your destiny. So what I want to do today is I want to share three important, very important 
biblical principles to enable us to overcome our past so that you can thrive. And the first one is this, if, you, if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, you still need to write it down, okay? That is that in Christ, you, I, we are completely, completely forgiven. Isn't that good news, y'all? That in Christ, I, we, all of us, we are completely forgiven. Now, aren't you glad that when Jesus came, he didn't just partially forgive us of our sins? He completely forgave us of our sins. We get a fresh start. We are made new. Now, let me get a quick show of hands real quick. And I can see it's a little dark in here. Even online, if you're online, put a little hand in the chat if this is you. How many of you guys have ever purchased a brand new vehicle in your lifetime? Anybody? I see some hands. I see some hands. A brand new vehicle. So the first brand new vehicle that I ever bought was actually the 2010 Chevy Silverado that I drive to this day. And when I first got that truck, man, I was pumped up. I was excited. I was out there, I was cleaning it up every single day. I made sure that my rims were always shiny, you know, the interior was always spotless. Man, I was proud of my 2010 Silverado. Fast forward a few years, we move here to Austin, Texas, and I have to use the truck as a work vehicle pulling the trailer for the church. And so it's the very first Sunday of the church. I hook up that trailer to the truck, and I'm on my way to church, and as I stop at a stoplight, the trailer did not stop. My truck stopped, but the trailer did not stop, and it actually smashed into the back of my truck, leaving a giant dent in the back. And I get out of the car on Highway 71, and I look at that dent, and as soon as I see that dent, it just made me sick to my stomach. I'm thinking, oh man, my baby, you know? This was my baby, this was my first brand new truck, and now it's got this giant dent in the back of it. So I went on ahead and I reattached the trailer and I got it back hooked up and I went on into church and I preached my first sermon at Thrive Austin Church. It was incredible. It was amazing. I loved it. There was like 10 people there, but it was still awesome. It was amazing. Dale might even have been there, actually. Dale, I think he might have been there for that. And, uh, you know, I felt great because the dream was coming to life. And, man, I was so excited. And I just felt wonderful until I stepped outside and I took a look at my truck. And all of a sudden, you know, I was feeling so good, but then I saw that dent, and it reminded me of the trailer smashing into the back of my truck, and I mean, I realized, man, my brand new truck is not so brand new anymore, and that dent, suddenly, once again, I felt sick to my stomach, and to this day, honestly, no matter what kind of day I'm having, when I look at that dent, it still kind of makes me feel a little bit, I'm tired, I just, that, that dent drives me crazy, and here's the thing. Sometimes that's how it can work in our lives. When we've got things in our past that we regret. We can be having the best day in the world until we see him. Or until we see her. Or until we hear that song. And that song reminds us of that season. And suddenly all of the pain and all of the shame and all of the guilt come flooding back and all of a sudden, no matter what kind of mood we were in, we feel the weight of our shame and our guilt and our pain. And if that's you and you are here today or listening on the stream, I just want to say to you, look, I get it. I understand the pain, but the beautiful thing about the cross and the beautiful thing about the gospel is that in Christ, you, I, we, we are completely, completely forgiven. And friends, that is good news. That through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, no matter what mistakes we've made in our past, what mistakes we make today, through the cross, you, I, we are completely, completely forgiven. You know why we feel so condemned for the mistakes that we make? It's because we know who we really are. Not only do we know the sins that everybody else knows about, but we know what's inside. We know those secret sins, the ones that nobody else knows about it. And most people at the core of their being wonder if people really knew who I was, would they really, really love me? But aren't you glad that in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? And so guess what? God knows our hearts better than even we know our hearts ourselves. 
He knows about every secret sin. He knows about every lie. He knows about the abortion. He knows about the pornography site. He knows about the affair. He knows about the adultery. He knows about every single secret sin. The things that nobody else knows about. But the moment we come into the presence of God. And the moment that we confess our sins. You, I, we, through the power of the cross. Are completely, completely forgiven. And if that doesn't get somebody excited, uh, I don't know what will. Can I please get an amen in the house today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. You see, forgiveness, it's not something that's achieved. It's something that's only received. And I got to say, you know, sometimes I don't always feel forgiven. But sometimes I got to remind myself that the facts of God's word are greater than the feelings that I might be experiencing in my life. And I've discovered that even when I don't feel forgiven, sometimes I gotta preach to myself. Y'all ever preach to yourselves, or is that just me? Am I just the only crazy one? Sometimes I gotta preach to myself. And I just gotta celebrate. I gotta celebrate the cross. I gotta celebrate the empty tomb. I gotta celebrate the fact that I got a God who knows every single square inch of my heart, and yet He still loves me just the same as His child. And he embraces me, even in my brokenness, even in my mistakes, which there are many of them. But God, in his great love and in his great mercy, he extends that hand of mercy. And he says, come to me, my beloved son. You are welcome. You are my child. You see, in Christ, you, I, we, we are completely, completely forgiven. The second important principle for us to grasp, if we are ever going to get past our past, is that in Christ, I, you, we are incredibly, incredibly valuable. You know, a few years ago, my house got broken into, and it was rough. I don't know if you've ever been broken into before, but it's terrible. The feelings of pain and betrayal and anger, I mean, all of it, I was mad. They broke in and they stole a couple laptops, stole a computer, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff. And every once in a while, I tell somebody the story, uh, you know, because actually when they opened the laptop, I could see where they were. My little find my iPhone thing came on. I could see exactly where they were. And every once in a while, somebody says, well, why didn't you go kick the door in and get your stuff back, man? I mean, why didn't you go kick their butts and get your iPad back? I'm like, man, my life is not worth an iPad. I'm sorry. It's just not worth it. Okay. But if they would have stolen my driver's license, If they would have stolen my driver's license, I might have gone over there and tried to get it. You know why? Because if I lose my driver's license, then I got to go to the DMV. And I don't want to go to the DMV. And if you're here today and you're listening to the the, the stream today and you you work at the DMV, I'm sorry. But could you put a smile on your face? I mean, come on. But the DMV, I mean, it drives me crazy. I would rather get shot 15 times than go to the DMV, okay? It would be worth it to go get my license to avoid going to the DMV. But the truth is, is that if something's really, really valuable to you, you'll be willing to lay your life down for it. Am I right? Mothers, am I right? It's true. See, how many of y'all know that the value of something, it's usually determined by the price that somebody's willing to pay for it. Did you know that? The value of something is determined by the price that someone is really willing to pay. For example, real estate, we really see this. I want to put a picture of a TV, uh, of, a, of a house up here on the screen. So look at that house for a second. How much do you think that that house is worth? I just want to get some guesses. You can put it in the chat. Well, how much do y'all think this house is worth up here on the screen? Anybody just shout out a guess. Where, where is it? Oh, where is it? That's actually a really, really good question. You guys are smart. Y'all are really smart. So this happens to be in the 78704, okay? What do you think that house goes for? 650, yeah. 600, 750. Any other guesses? 1.1. 1.1. That's going to be our closest guess. That house right there, I looked it up just this week. It just sold for $1.3 million. $1.3 $1.3 million for that house. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be really, really honest. I don't see it. I don't see it. That does not look like a $1.3 million house to me. I just don't see it. I would never in a million years pay, for, pay that much money for that house. But let me ask you a question. Is that house worth $1.3 million? The answer is yes. Because somebody was willing to pay that much for it, right? 
Because if the value of something is determined by the price that somebody is willing to pay, and somebody was willing to pay $1.3 million for that house, it means that it is worth $1.3 million. So you might ask, where are you going with this, Pastor? Here's where I'm going with this. The Bible tells us that Jesus paid the ultimate price for your sin and for my sin. Our loving Heavenly Father, He gave that which was most valuable to Himself for us. He gave His only Son for you and for me. And if there's nothing else in this world that would make you think that you have value, the fact that God gave His only Son for you and for me means that you, I, we are incredibly valuable to God. You have value to God. And in Christ, your value it's not determined by the mess that you've made, but the price that Jesus paid for you and for me. The third and final principle for us to really grab a hold of if we are going to get past our past is that in Christ, you, I, we are unconditionally loved. Now, I've got to be honest. I don't unconditionally love people. And I'm sorry. I know that might sound kind of bad as a pastor. You know, I probably should. But I don't unconditionally love people. And let's just be honest, you don't either, okay? I mean, can we all agree that there are some people in this world that are just difficult to love? Am I right or am I right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, for example, close talkers. Close talkers, they don't, they don't understand personal space. Like, hard, hard to love, right? Uh, you know, negative people, always negative. Doesn't matter what's going on, just always got something to complain about. You know, it, hard to love, right? It's, it's hard to love. Negative people. People who drive in the passing lane and don't pass. Come on, somebody. Like, that drives me crazy. It is called the passing lane for one reason. Why? Because that is where you pass. That is exactly right. And when people drive in the passing lane, especially here in Texas, and they're not passing, it just, it's hard to love people who drive in the passing lane and don't <laughs> pass. There are some people in this world that I have a hard time loving. But you know who I don't have a hard time loving? My children. My children. I don't have a hard time loving my children. And the reason why is not because they deserve it. I'll tell you that. I don't love my children because they are so amazing and they deserve my love. Even though they are amazing. But that's not the reason why I love them. I don't love them because of their performance. And I don't know about you guys, but my kids arrived on this planet with an attitude. Maybe your children are like that, but mine were. And I've never met a single baby in my life who said in the middle of the night, you know what? I think I'm going to forego my need for food and to have a diaper change right now in this moment. And I know how much mommy and daddy really need their rest. And so you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to sleep through the night instead of crying and whining at 3 o'clock in the morning so that they come and feed me. And I'm going to forgo my need for instant gratification so that mommy and daddy can have what they need so that they can be happier, more productive people. No. I've never met a single baby that ever thought that to themselves. They come into this world with an attitude. That's how they come out of the box. It's just the truth. And I do not love my children because of their performance, because they get great grades, because they're great at sports. That's not why we love our kids. You know the reason why we love our children? It's because they're your children. And all of our children, they have a special place in our hearts as our children. And I would guess that you even love them when they're messy even when they're messy. One night a few years ago after small group, my middle daughter Tatum, we were wrapping things up and the adults were kind of hanging out, chatting in the kitchen area and the kids, they were all really small. Sarah happened to be out of town on this particular night and we had just had Charlie. So I had all three children to myself leading small group, okay? Which it went, I think it went wonderfully personally, but. Um, so Charlie was like a year old. Tatum was like three or something like that. Brayden was like six. And so all of the kids, they're all running around and I'm doing what kids do, right? And suddenly as I'm laughing and, you know, having snacks after small group, I hear this loud, just smash. And then I hear Tatum start to cry. And so I run into the living room and I'm like, Tatum, Tatum, what's going on? Tatum, what happened? And I will never forget her face as she stood in that living room. And what had happened was she fell and she smashed one of her teeth out on the coffee table. Father of the year, right? But I will never forget that moment 
when I looked at her and with tears streaming down her face and blood all over the place, blood on her clothes, blood on the carpet, she reached her hands up to me and she said, Daddy, Daddy, it hurts. Daddy, help me, it hurts. Now let me pause real quick and tell you what I did not do there in that moment. What I did not do was I did not say, Tatum, don't you know who you were talking to? I am your father, and you need to clean yourself up before you come into my presence. I mean, there you are with blood all over you, tears all over your eyes. You need to clean up your mess. You need to change your clothes. And once you get all your act together, you get everything cleaned up, then you can come into your, to my presence. I am your father. You better get yourself cleaned up before you even approach me. No, that wasn't my response. You know what I did there in that moment? I grabbed a hold of Tatum. I lifted her up in my arms. I cleaned up her mess. I held her. I hugged her until she stopped crying. Why? Because I am her father. And as her father, I am bigger than the mess that she made. And I came to tell somebody here tonight, even in this hot church, you know, where it is hot. I came to tell somebody here today that we serve a heavenly father who loves us more than we can even imagine. That even in our mess, he reaches down into our mess. He's not afraid of our mess. He picks us up. He grabs a hold of us and he cleans us up. Why? Because our heavenly father loves us more. He is greater. The love that he has for us is greater than any mess that we could ever make in our lives. And we don't have to clean ourselves up before we come into the presence of God. You know, so often in the church, I think it's preached that like you got to get it all together. You got to go to all the right Bible studies. You got to give all the right tithes. You got to do all the right things. And then once you do all the right things and you get your life cleaned up, then you can go into the presence of God. But actually, it's the opposite. We serve a loving God who even when our backs are turned on him, on him, he comes in the middle of our mess and he rescues us, pulling us up out of the pit, putting his spirit on us and using us to do incredible things. For the cause of the kingdom of God. Amen. That is the God that we serve. Yes. And I don't know about you guys, but I am thankful that Christ has forgiven me of my sin. Yes. That he has power washed my soul. That he has turned me into a new creation. That he finds me valuable. Do you know that God finds you valuable? You are of tremendous value to God. Did you know that, James? That you have incredible worth and incredible value to God. You do. God sees all of us as children and, and we have immense value to God. And so when we recognize that in him we are forgiven, we have value, and we are loved. That enables us to put our past behind us. To look forward to the future and to step into a world where we thrive in our relationship with God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Today, as the worship team comes up, I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. And here's the thing, the Holy Spirit, he's already here. Yes. I mean, he's been moving. I mean, he's already been doing stuff. But I'm going to invite him to come more, to come in power. And we have a few people here today who've been praying for this service. They've been praying for you who believe that they have heard from God on your behalf. And they're going to share a few words, prophetic words that hopefully will speak to your heart. But before they come up here and do that, I just want to offer the invitation to anybody to anybody who is yet to make that first step, that first step to receive the forgiveness of God. If you're here and, and you're here in person and you would say, I want to do that for the very first time, I want to commit my life to Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand where I can see it. If that's you. If you would say, Tonight, for the very first time, I want to commit my life, my heart to Jesus. Just raise your hand. If you're tuning in on the stream, no matter where you are, 
And you're in that place where you say, I want to give my life to Jesus for the very first time. Please, direct message us. Let us know. Somebody would love to get with you and to pray with you. But maybe there are others who are here tonight who maybe you don't need to start following Jesus for the very first time. But maybe you've got some dents. Maybe you've made a mess. And maybe those dents and maybe that mess have caused you to doubt. You know, maybe, maybe I'm not loved by God. Maybe I don't have God. Maybe I'm not forgiven. And if you would say that that's you and you would like to receive prayer today, I just invite you to just put your hand where I can see it and I would love to personally pray with you. Well, as we enter into this time of sharing prophetic words, I just invite you, if you need ministry for anything at all, we would love to pray for you while you're here. So I'm going to invite up um, Scott. You had a word? sharing with uh, youth just a little bit ago and talking about this same concept that we talked about in youth. And I shared a little bit about myself. One of, the, one of the words that came to me, and I feel in my heart, and I, I feel that I know somebody else is feeling this tonight. There's darkness. There's a darkness when this happens. When you feel that you've done something that just is just so big that it can't be you can't, you can't find yourself being loved. Um, and, you, and you've thought about it and you've welled it up in your mind and you've gone over and over on it and you've perseverated on it. And you just feel that you're in this dark place and you cannot... Like, what, what, what the message is, is is just not for you. You don't believe that. But that's not true. That is not true at all. It is in the darkness that you will find you will find strength in the Lord. You will find love of the Lord who reaches out to you and wants you to be with Him. You can overcome that darkness. That darkness is not going to consume you. Step out of the darkness. Be brave. You do not know what's going to happen, but God will take care of you. He will be there to lead you out. Such a great word. If there's anybody who would say that resonates in your spirit and you want to respond by receiving prayer, I just invite you to just raise your hand where we can see it so that you can receive prayer. God is here. He wants to meet you. He wants to help you step out of darkness and into light. There's no shame in responding and saying, that's me, that's me. Leona, you want to come up and share? Um, the Lord just gave me the, uh, the word transformation. And I believe that God is, is uh, stirring your spirit and wants to transform you. There's times where you, you talked about your past. Uh, there's times in your past, whether it's shame that you have from something you've done or someone who hurt you greatly, um, sometimes there's a process for you to heal and, and move on from that. But sometimes God wants to take care of it just like that. Just like that. He wants you to be free. 
And I believe that we are in one of those moments right now. And so I would ask you to really listen to God tugging at you. Really respond to the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And come to the altar and give it to Him and allow Him to remove that from you. So I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come now and press upon the hearts of everyone here, that you would just speak to them, Jesus, the thing that you want to have them have freedom from. And we just ask for your Holy Spirit to pour out an anointing in this place right here, right now, Father God, that we would fill your presence all around us like a heavy cloud, Lord Jesus, and that we would just be uh, fall to our knees, Lord, at your presence, Father God, at the love that you have for us, Jesus, that you want freedom in our lives, God, and we just lay it down before you, Jesus, if we say, take it, Lord, we receive your love, we receive your forgiveness, we just thank you, Jesus, and we lay it at your feet, receive it from you, Holy Spirit. Just thank you, Jesus, for your presence and your love. Just lay it down. He wants to see you free. Thank you, Jesus. I don't, I don't know if there's anybody, somebody here named Lacey, or somebody knows someone named Lacey, or Lacey is looking online, but there's somebody by the name of Lacey, who God specifically wants to heal you from something tragic that happened to you when you were little.
moment of falling on your knees and saying, yes, God, then you just do it. Because he wants to pour out on you the things that you're crying for. You're crying and he hears you, but you have to move. So, Father, we pray that you would pour it out, God. Just pour it out on us. Pour it out on your church, Lord. We just pray for more, Lord. More blessing, Lord. More peace. More power. More of you, God. Lord, we need you, God. We need more of you. More of your goodness. More of your mercy. More of your love. More of your grace. More, Lord. Pour it out. Pour it out on us. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe on your church. We are here for you. We are here for you. Come, Jesus.
tell them. Jesus loves me, this I know. Have you ever heard that old song? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Uh, excuse me, that's enough of that. Jesus does love you. Even though you sinned, you messed up, it don't matter. He loves everybody. But Jesus, he ain't never messed up. He ain't never sinned. In fact, he gave his life on the cross to pay the price for your sin. That's right. Jesus gave his all for us, so we got to give our all for him. We got to show that we really love him because he showed he loves us. So anytime, I mean anytime somebody asks you what's up, you tell them. Jesus loves me, this I know. And that right there is what's up. I got a rainbow of flavor and I'm living for my savior. Skittles out, baby. Hello, Thrive Kids. I love you so much, love you so much. We are still in our series about standing up. We, st we talked about standing up for justice. We talk talked about standing up for joy. And this week we are talking about standing up for love. Let's play a little game real quick, okay? When I say hugs, you put a big O in the sky. And when I say kisses, you put a big X, okay? Now I might throw some words in there that are not hugs and kisses, so you have to listen and pay attention, okay? Here we go. Hugs. Hugs. Kisses. Hugs. Hogs. Did I get you? Hugs. Kisses. Hugs and kisses. Kisses and hugs. Hogs, pogs. Moms. Dogs. Hugs. Moms and dogs. Kisses. Hugs and kisses. Okay, let's talk about the definition of love. Now, you think, well, love is like when people are kind and when people do their best and when they give you things. Well, actually, the definition of love, the most purest definition of love is actually Jesus. It's God. There couldn't be anything more pure than God. Jesus loves us so much that, number one, he died on the cross for us. Number two, he heals us when we're sick. He has even uh, made dead people come back to life again. He had a friend named Lazarus, and they were friends. They would eat dinner together, and Lazarus had sisters. And so when Lazarus died, uh, Mary and Martha, they were like, Jesus, please bring our brother back. And he said, yes, I will bring your brother back because I love you. Jesus stands up for love. Everything Jesus did was because of love. He fed the hungry. He watched out for the widows and the orphans and for the poor people. But guess what else he did because he loved you? He made you. He made you exactly the way you are. Big, little, brown hair, yellow hair, big eyes. Look at these big old eyes. I've got the biggest eyes. And sometimes we think, well, I'm not perfect. I don't know why. Why wouldn't God just just make me perfect, like me. I got one big eye, then one eye's like sometimes so little. It's like, it's, it drives me crazy sometimes. I'm in a picture, I'm like trying to make my eyes the same size. But God says, I don't care about the size of your eyes, girl. I love you no matter what. I love you no matter what you do. You guys remember that story I've told you in Sunday school a couple times where I stabbed my brother with a fork in his shoulder because he messed with my baby doll. That's right, guess what? God said, Jesse, please don't do it again, but I still love you. And I said, I'm sorry. Later, later, later on, like yesterday, I was like, okay, I'm sorry. No, but no matter what you do, no matter what you look like, no matter what you say, no matter what your attitude is, Jesus still loves you because Jesus stands up for love, right? And we know that whatever Jesus stands up for, we gotta stand up for it too. We stand up for justice, we stand up for joy, and we're gonna stand up for love. So let's talk about some ways we can stand up for love. There's so many, and I know you're gonna think of like one million more things than I am, okay? But here's five. How about you write a letter to a friend you haven't seen in a very long time, put it in the mailbox, 
ask your mom for a stamp, okay? Or you can send an email, or you can draw a picture to your teacher, either your new ones or your old ones. Uh, number three, the guy that actually brings the mail, the mailman, it would be nice maybe if you put out some water for him, or maybe a thank you note, thank you for bringing the toys during Christmas that your grandma and grandpa uh, give you. Number four, you could help a neighbor with their yard work. You could go pick up the trash, pick up the leaves. If you see a homeless person and you think they're hungry, you can give them food, a sandwich, maybe some Kool-Aid. Number five, this is the biggest one I thought of. You could go clean your brother or your sister's bedroom for them. I know. And if you can do that one, I think that's the biggest one that you can go and show Jesus' love. Say no matter how many times we fight, how many times we don't like each other and we stab each other with forks, that I love you and I wanna do something nice to you and for you, just like Jesus does. Can you stand up for love? 